If we analyze all the communistic publications of the period after 1991, it becomes clear that their authors still do not understand how their former leaders, on the basis of Marxism-Leninism, brought the USSR to collapse and generated such theoreticians as E.T. Gaidar. Many people remember the widely spread slogans, the Marxist doctrine is omnipotent because it is true. Meanwhile, the year of 1991 and the subsequent years not only cast doubt on the omnipotence of this doctrine, but have also exposed the functional inoperability of the methodology of the thoughtless slogan breakthroughs ending in the well-known, we wanted the best, but it turned out as always. History does not tolerate subjunctive moods. We got exactly what was possible within the framework of the dominant teaching, because the insurance of the stability of the system created on its basis against any impacts, both internal and external, is the measure of its practical usefulness. When everything collapses like a house of cards, then the origins of the collapse should be sought not in particular mistakes, but in the foundation. The limit of the trust towards the theory of Marxism has been exhausted. It is on the basis of Marxism that the people of the richest country in all respects of the world are dragging out a shameful, miserable existence. The time has come for the ordinary Russian man, unlike the elite waiting for the next slogans, to independently comprehend the basics of economics and finance, to replace the belief in the deceitful authorities for his own world understanding. It is not the gods who burn our pots. Curiously, the theory of Marxism generated by the systems of supranational governance retains its untouchability even now. You have likely noticed that the same masters of both our left and right parties do not allow criticism of Marx by either one or the other. Viktor Alexeyevich, you substantiate the inconsistency of Marxism by the results of our development on its basis. This has its own logic. But we would like to see concrete manifestations of this inconsistency in the theory itself. Let us begin with the most important thing, with the political economy of Marxism. There is such a science as metrology. This is the science of measurement. So, Marxism is a metrologically inconsistent doctrine. It operates with abstractions that cannot be measured in practice and connected with life, with the solution of practically significant tasks. If you find yourself in production, then you will not be able to measure the volumes of necessary and surplus products. Not a single clock will show you where the necessary working time ends and where the surplus time begins. To put it differently, real accounting and production control cannot be conducted on the basis of Marxist political economy. The Marxist doctrine had completely exposed its inconsistency by the beginning of the 1950s. Since then, the crisis of the pseudo-communistic development of the USSR that was aggravating over time arose. A harsh exposure of Marxism, a factual death sentence, was carried out in relation to it in 1952 in the work by J.B. Stalin, Economic Problems of Socialism in the USSR. This circumstance, in my opinion, was decisive. Precisely because of this, Stalin's works were factually, although not juridically, banned, and he himself was murdered in a villainous manner. Listen attentively to the text of the work of J.V. Stalin. Further, I think we must also discard certain other concepts taken from Marx's capital, where Marx was concerned with an analysis of capitalism and artificially applied to our socialist relations. I am referring to such concepts, among others, as necessary and surplus labor, necessary and surplus product, necessary and surplus time. I think that our economists should put an end to this incongruity between the old concepts and the new state of affairs in our socialist country by replacing the old concepts with new ones that correspond to the new situation. We could tolerate this incongruity for a certain period, but the time has come to put an end to it. This is a statement of extreme methodological significance. We have already mentioned in the previous programs that the terminological apparatus is the basis of the basics in governance. And what can you say about the mistakes of the philosophy of Marxism? The first result that Marxism achieved is that with a simple mention of this theme, any normal person becomes bored and loses interest towards the interlocutor. The obvious uselessness of the philosophy of Marxism in life practice stems from the initially erroneous formulation of the fundamental question of philosophy as the question of the correlationship between consciousness and being. What is primary? Is consciousness able to correctly reflect the world? 
The first question lies outside the scope of proofs by means of logic. Consciousness, idea, information, and matter are two sides of the same phenomenon. There is no abstract matter without concrete informational characteristics, just as there is no information without a material carrier. By the way, this is evidenced by the centuries-old, meaningless and essenceless disputes between the schools of materialists and idealists. They were included in the standard biblical algorithmics, divide and conquer. In addition, even if something were primary, nothing would change because of this in practice. As for the second question, without any scientific tricks, any reasoning person understands that knowledge about the world may correspond to the world or may not correspond to it. But the fundamental question of practically useful wisdom is the question of the predictability of the consequences of man's activity. The consequences of the application of this or that knowledge remain outside the framework of Marxism. In other words, the only adequate formulation of the fundamental question of philosophy is reduced to the possibility of foreseeing the future at the level of a person, family, state, and finally, of all humanity. In accordance with the study of this issue, a person should choose a variant of the best behavior both today and in the foreseeable future. Throughout the entire history of our civilization, it is precisely to such questions that the practical interest has never weakened. Similar views on the fundamental question of the vital philosophy were expressed during Marx's lifetime, but they remained unnoticed by him. The 19th century English anthropologist E.B. Tyler, a contemporary of Karl Marx and F. Engels, declared, and I quote, The philosophy of history at large, explaining the past and predicting the future phenomena of man's life in the world by reference to general laws, is in fact a subject with which, in the present state of knowledge, even genius, aided by wide research, seems but hardly able to cope. The statement of Napoleon Bonaparte is similar in meaning and goes as follows. To listen to the interests of all marks an ordinary government. To foresee them marks a great government. Blaise Pascal said, to predict is to win. Viktor Alexeyevich, what can you say about the most important component of Marxism, dialectical materialism? I have never heard any doubts about the generally recognized laws. The unity and struggle of opposites, the transformation of quantity into quality, the law of negation of negation. I maintain that these laws are not just erroneous. They create purpose-oriented perversions in the perception of objective reality. The perversions are in fact birthmarks of the biblical doctrine that are needed by the masters of Marxism. This is most clearly presented in the first of the laws you mentioned. After all, the unity and struggle of opposites according to Marx are realized in such a way that unity is relative, and the struggle is absolute. In fact, all this is an exact mold of the fundamental principle of the biblical conception of governance, divide and conquer. But the objective world is arranged differently. The basis of development is not a struggle, and the essence of this first law could be reflected in the following definition, the law of interaction of multi-qualitative phenomena. First, the interaction can be not only paired, and it is not necessarily expressed in the form of a struggle for destruction. The bloody massacre of the white and red in 1917 is an inalienable consequence of Marxism. This supposedly sole necessity was realized in the country. Marxism provokes class struggle by deliberately opposing business owners and employees. And for what? In order to hide the true mechanisms of equal oppression of both one and the other. Their ruin is realized by bank usury through the financial credit system with a non-zero loan interest. In reality, the business owner and the employee are on the same boat. Although they have fundamentally different functions in the scheme of receiving profit, in the scheme of obtaining the final result. But the final result can be achieved only in the process of interaction of these two multi-qualitative participants of production. This example, although a particular one, is a good illustration of the setting of objectives of one of the laws of Marxist dialectics. They are reduced to the purpose-oriented incitement of contradictions in one national economic complex through appointed opponents. The subsequent self-destruction of the country is written off by announcement on the objective course of things, on the role of a set-up, prepared through the bypassing of his consciousness, personality and history, who realizes this supposedly sole possible necessity. Herewith, 
Marxism does not clearly say anything about governance as the possibility of removing a governed system from a set of multivariate objectives into one of the previously outlined and more preferable ones. What can you say about the law of transformation of quantitative changes into qualitative ones? The wording of this law is superficial and vague. In objective reality, quality is determined not only by quantity, but also by measure and orderedness. For example, from the same atoms you can get different substances depending on their inorderedness and existing interconnections. Both quantitative and ordinal changes lead to qualitative changes. In turn, qualitative changes are expressed in quantitative and ordinal changes. Well, and finally, the law of negation of negation. Do you also cast doubt on the constructiveness and objectiveness of this law? Yes, from the standpoint of the conception of social safety, dead water, which I represent, this law is no less harmful to society than the two previous ones. For it, of course, one can make up all sorts of ennobling comments, saying that a negation means reaching a qualitatively new level of development, but a negation in the form of a collapse also fits quite well into the formulation of this law. After all, a collapse is an indisputable negation of what happened before it. The law of negation of negation absolutizes one of the facets of the process, and the name of this process, which reflects the world, is a series of transformations. And when an oak grows, the main thing in this process is not actually that the acorn is negated. Development, in our view, is not a sequence of negations in the form of hassling and walking around in a circle. We formulate this law differently, as a sequence of transformations on the basis of internal and external algorithmics in the interaction of multi-qualitatives. The law of negation of negation, in fact, leads away from the always available few paths to a true transformation into a better quality. Why create something if a negation follows? Why struggle for the happiness of the people? The victory will be negated anyway. This law does not give anything new, and is a pseudo-scientific expression of the Old Testament possessions set forth in chapters 1 and 3, Ecclesiastes. Further on, I quote the Bible. A time to rend, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh, and that wherein he laboureth? I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Here is the methodological basis of Marxism, which in all other questions is nothing more than a secular modification of the biblical doctrine. The Marxist term social division of labor is also harmful because in social production there exists the opposite process of combining the labor of many individuals to obtain a common result. Today, active attempts are being made to reintroduce Marxism into Russia. This will not work. As Kosma Prudkov said, one cannot hatch the same egg twice. Viktor Alexeyevich, what practical conclusions come from your evaluations of Marxism? What are the perspectives for bodybuilding? Today in Russia, there exists only one organization that, by inertia, retains all the characteristics of a party and significant membership. This is the Communist Party. All the aforementioned testifies to the fact that it has no future, because its leaders have not comprehended the harmfulness of the foundation on which it still rests to this day. All the other parties, just like the Communist one, work strictly within the framework of the biblical conception of governance. In terms of methodologically significant aspects, there is no difference between them. Under different names, the so-called party of power has always existed in our country and will continue to exist. This is a party that works according to the principle, what would you have me do? It, not having any willpower, fulfills all the commands and recommendations of the authorities. It is impossible to count on it as the initiator of the reorganization of our statehood just as it's impossible to rely on something that does not offer resistance. Our team has worked out the self-sufficient conception of social safety and is ready to assist the president in his development for a start in our country. Do you think that there have been some objective prerequisites for its emergence in the country? The emergence of our conceptual party is predetermined by the course of historical development. It emerged exactly at the moment when the majority of our people the majority of voters stopped perceiving this whole biblical mess of a seemingly multi-party system, this whole pseudo-electoral mess. At the unconscious level of the psyche in the country, our people have already consciously realized 
that there is actually no party to choose from. All the parties are tarred with the same brush. They say the same words about our people's happiness, only in different phrases. And under the guise of these words, they solve fundamentally different tasks, exacerbating the poverty of the people. In words, by announcement, this is one thing. In deeds and by default, another. Such a psychological phenomenon has been named by our people, possession. In our definition, it is psychological Trotskyism, which arose long before Trotsky. But he was the most prominent representative of this type of psyche structure. No, we cannot feed more than one party. This is what the voters state. An atmosphere of expectation of a system of new worldview knowledge and a new conception of governance is reigning in our society. That is why the number of voters hardly exceeds 25%. And among those who come to the elections, the most numerous group were those who voted against everyone. This was shown by the elections in the 39th constituency of St. Petersburg, as evidenced by the elections to the city council in the city of Pskov. Those who don't vote and vote against everyone are potential allies of the conceptual party, a party with a new worldview. In conclusion, I would like to quote a landmark publication from the newspaper named Viek, number 4, made in 2002. The article is called Mind, Honor and Sovest of the Oncoming Days, with the subtitle The Ruling Party Ousts the Party of Power. If the party of power in our country plays the role of exclusively a support group, printing out presidential and government bills in the Duma, then the ruling party claims to have a qualitatively different role in the political system. It takes a direct role in the working out of a pan-national strategy of development, vests it with a legislative formalization through its parliamentary faction, and implements a program of actions through the government in which it is widely represented or which it forms itself. Finally, the ruling party nominates a presidential candidate from its ranks. These are the tasks that the conceptual party unity sets.